What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about low carb diets. Again, because a new systematic review has been recently published that's pretty expansive. And one of the reasons I really like this systematic review was it specifically looked at obese people. One of the pushbacks I get when I talk about low carb diets versus low fat or balanced diets is people will say, well, that probably works for regular people or people who are like you who are lean. But I know that if you're type two diabetic or obese, you know, you have to do a low carb diet because there's no way you can lose weight and get your blood glucose under control if you're not doing a low carb diet. You know, some, something to that effect. This systematic review was very expansive. 61 randomized control trials were included in over 6,500 participants. One nice part about this is they were randomized control trials. So these were studies done with a higher degree of control than you'd get from say cohort studies or correlation data, those sorts of things. This was actually under greater levels of control than what we'd normally see. They looked at these studies in obese who had type two diabetes and obese who didn't have type two diabetes to see if there was any difference between the two. And they looked at things like amount of weight lost, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, and HbA1c. HbA1c is basically where hemoglobin, the hemoglobin molecule can become glycosylated or basically a glucose molecule gets attached to it. If your blood sugar gets too high. So like for example, a normal HbA1c is like around a five or just under that. If you start getting more HbA1c, it indicates that your blood glucose is pretty high for a large period of time. And the reason you know that is because HbA1c really doesn't respond to short changes in blood glucose. Because red blood cells have a lifespan of about 120 days, I believe, it takes time for that HbA1c number to really see significant changes. It's it's a really good marker, especially in free living folks, of kind of their overall exposure to glucose. So if they're insulin sensitive and they're clearing glucose well, that number should be in the normal range. If they're not insulin sensitive and they're not clearing glucose well, they're likely to have elevations in HbA1c. What did they find in this study? Well, they looked at low carb, versus balanced diets. And most of the low carb diets were anywhere from 50 to 150 grams of carbohydrate a day. There were some trials that were included that were very low carbohydrate that were under 50 grams per day. And then the balanced diets were basically if the carbohydrate intake was over 45% of daily calories. And most of the low carb diets were a little bit higher in protein as well, around 20% of daily calories. So it wasn't like they were a, a low carb, high fat, low protein protein, they were modestly high in protein, modestly high in fat and low in carbohydrate on average. Now there was differences because again, some were just low carbohydrate, some were very low carbohydrate. But again, when we do systematic reviews, we're attempting com to compile this data. So what did they find? Well, they really didn't see differences in pretty much anything. There was a small difference in the amount of weight loss in the first eight months in people who were obese without type two diabetes. I think it was like a difference of about a 1.2 kilos. But when you consider that low carb diets cause up to like two and a half kilos of water loss, that's not really a significant difference. And it didn't really impact any of the blood markers. So when they looked at people and their HbA1c, their blood pressure, their LDL cholesterol, they didn't really see any differences in any of the markers they assessed. And that was true for obese without type two diabetes and obese with two, type two diabetes. So what does this data mean? These data are trying to synthesize large numbers of studies. Large systematic reviews like these do tend to drown out a lot of small differences. But again, we do see these in very tightly controlled studies, especially when calories are equated. So calories, I don't believe were even equated in this study. In studies where they equate calories, we really don't see a lot of difference between low carb and other studies. Now I will say with regards to blood markers, while they didn't see a difference in LDL cholesterol in this study, what you tend to see with really highly controlled like inpatient feedings of low carb versus low fat 
is low fat tends to be a little bit better at reducing LDL cholesterol, especially if the fiber is higher, but not as good at reducing triacylglycerides in the blood and usually not as good at raising HDL. It's not really a big difference, but there does tend to be some differences. But what I will say is when people lose weight, regardless of if it's balanced or low fat or low carb, all those blood markers improve and that also includes uh, blood pressure. This study doesn't really tell us anything that we didn't already know and haven't been saying on this channel, which is a low carb diet is a perfectly viable way to lose weight. It's a perfectly viable way to lower your HbA1c, but especially when you equate calories compared to other diets, it doesn't appear to be superior. A lot of people will say, well, how could a low fat diet that's high in carbohydrate be better for reducing HbA1c? That can't be true because you're getting an insulin spike and blood glucose spike after every meal. And again, this boils down to people not understanding the difference between an acute response versus a long-term response. Just because you have a blood glucose spike over a few short hours doesn't really mean anything for long-term blood glucose control. A great comparison to that would be when you exercise, you increase inflammatory markers, you increase reactive oxygen species, you increase your heart rate, you increase your blood pressure. All of those things are things that we would consider bad, but it's for a very short period of time. And so on the long term, those markers actually improve. I would really advise you against putting so much stock in what happens after a single meal. That's why people with continuous glucose monitors who are watching their blood glucose after every meal, again, it doesn't really make a difference on long-term outcomes as long as the groups in terms of the diets we're comparing are isocaloric and people lose similar amounts of weight. Again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do a low-carb diet. I'm not saying you can't do a low-carb diet. It is absolutely a viable tool for improving improving all of these health markers and a viable tool for losing weight. But based on the preponderance of evidence does not appear to be superior for weight loss or improving most blood markers of health when calories are equated between diets. So what does that mean? If you are somebody who would like to lose weight or you believe that losing weight would help improve your health, then you should try and find the diet that feels the easiest to you to adhere to. So you have to use some form of restriction, whether it's calorie counting, whether it's points, whether it's uh, low fat, low carb, intermittent fasting, you have to practice some form of restriction. But the great thing about what the data says is you can pick the form of restriction that feels the least restrictive for you as an individual. And that is what I advise. And that's what the data says is going to be best for you as an individual. If you're not sure how to set up your nutrition, we have a nutrition coaching app called Carbon Diet Coach, which has and offers all kinds of different dietary preferences, whether it's low carb, ketogenic, low fat, balanced, plant-based, we offer all of these and even within those specific dietary preferences, you have a range of, between which you can kind of shimmy your macros that you can kind of customize for you that's still gonna get you great results and still within the framework of coaching. So $9.99 per month. So I highly recommend that app. It's what I use to coach me. It is absolutely fabulous and we've served tens of thousands of people with it. So click the link in the description, go check it out. Also link to the studies in the description. Hope you guys have a great week.